Wisteria Hearst, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's such a beautiful day out. We were worried that it might be a little bit too warm in here, but we're hoping that it'll stay comfortable with the windows open. My name's Penny Martorell. I'm the curator here. And I just want to do a little housekeeping. If you need the restroom, go as straight as far as you can until you hit a fireplace and take a left. Um, and after the program, I want to invite you to take a visit in the gallery where the exhibit is and in the dining room. Um, I think you'll be impressed with what you see there. And tell your friends. We have the exhibit open until August 22nd. Mondays and Wednesdays, 10.30 to 12.30, and Tuesday evenings, 4.30 to 6.30. And if you have a group of people that you want to arrange to come, give us a call and we can make that arrangement for you. Um, so veterans, if you would raise your hands, Megan has a challenge coin to hand out to you. <laughs> <laughs> and while she's doing that, I just want to um, give a shout out and thanks to Jesus Pereira at the Holyoke Veterans Services who just received a brand new uh, display case so that he has a proper uh, case to display the uniforms down at Veterans Services. And so this event came out of uh, discussions with Doug Griffin, our moderator, who has been involved in our project since the beginning. Um, it's uh, funded by a grant from the Massachusetts State Historical Records Advisory Board Veterans Heritage Preservation Grant. It's a mouthful. Um, we're very much indebted to, to them uh, giving us funds to do all of this. and. So we wanted to give a voice to some different perspectives of what military service is. And Doug came up with this idea of putting this panel together. And, you know, he's a doer who gets stuff done. <laughs> and you're all here, and we got a good panel here. So um, please help me welcome Doug Griffin, our moderator. Who will introduce our guest. Thank you. I'm sure that you can probably hear me even if I don't use the mic. Um, if you uh, people at the, the desk uh, will please give yourselves a short bio uh, to let people know who you are. Uh, I'll start off. Uh, my name is Doug Griffin. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, but I lived most of my early childhood in Holyoke. Um, I lived in Holyoke until 1974 where, when I moved to Chicopee, been a resident of Chicopee ever since. Uh, in 1964, I was drafted into the U.S. Army, where I served as a, <coughs> excuse me, a medical corpsman for two years, uh, following which I did two years reserve, um, still as a medical corpsman, but I didn't do medical corpsman duties. Um, I took my basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Uh, my advanced individual training as a, as a medical corpsman down at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, and then spent the rest of the time back at Fort Dix, New Jersey, uh, training different companies, different, organiza different uh, military organizations, uh, unfortunately for service in the uh, Vietnam War. Um, but that is my military career. Uh, mm -hmm. I am the son of a, of a veteran. Uh, my uncles on both sides of my family and cousins were military people also. Uh, at the front desk we have uh, Marvin Dotson uh, who will talk about his military career. Uh, this is Lenora Teagle who will um, give you her side of the story as a military spouse, something that's not usually heard. We usually hear all about the veterans and what they do and what they did, but today we're also going to hear from the people who are were with them and gave them the necessary support they needed to do a good job. Uh, and also, we're gonna have, <coughs> excuse me, James Odom, military person, and John Kennedy, another military individual. So if you will please give a brief bio and we'll get started. And thank you everybody for being here today.
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marvin Dodson. I'm born and raised here in Holyoke. I currently live in Chickory, Massachusetts. I joined the Air Force right after high school, September 28th, 1983. First day at Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio. After basic training, I served four years active duty. My first time was at March Air Force Base in Riverside, California. Spent two years there. Spent a year at Comiso, Sicily. Different experience, I'd never been overseas before. Uh, with my first time flying, of course going through basic, then just going to different locations. But Sicily was a great time. I mean, my whole, whole active duty career was just meeting good people. I spent my last tour of active duty at Bergstrom Air Force Base in Austin, Texas. And after leaving Bergstrom, I took a six month break, came back to Holyoke, and a relative of mine spoke said, why well, do you keep working? Go back in the military. And I thought about it, so I went to the reserves at West Orbe Air Force Base, right outside Chickpea, Massachusetts. And I spent a total of 30 years in active duty reserve. Um, had some good tours of duty when I was at Westover. I went to Korea, Germany on a few occasions, Virginia. I caught it my second home sometimes because I went there a lot before 9-11. I deployed four times. I went to Kuwait, went to Qatar, some people call it Qatar, went to Iraq and Afghanistan, and it was a good career. I met great people. It was a great experience. I never left Holyoke before, but I was traveling all over the world. And it was a great career, and I'm thankful for it. I was born in Harlem, Virginia. I met my husband in 1958. I was going to school in Livingston, North Carolina. We married in 1961. And we married, we went to South Korea. He, I don't have my papers, he's traveling. I can't remember all these things. That mom is much younger than I So I have to keep them keep me going. He went to uh, Korea in 1961. He came back, went to Fort Bragg in 1962. Left Fort Bragg, went to Vietnam. Came back from Vietnam, went to Fort Dix. Came back from Fort Dix with the Fort Bragg. Left Fort Bragg, went to Hawaii. He, went, he came back to Fort Dix for the third time. In 1985, he retired. During that time, I had two sons, Daryl and George. George died in 2019. Sherman retired in 1985. It was a military life that I enjoyed. I met good people, like Marvin said. Most of the times were good. There were some bad times, but most of the times were good. And I was blessed, and I thank God for the experience I had being to a military man. And I can say a good military man. He was blessed, I was blessed by him, and the military was blessed by him. And I thank God for that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Jane Cotum. Uh, originally uh, born in Alabama, Mobile, Alabama. And I finished high school in 1963. June of 1963, I finished high school. And July 1st, 1963, I joined the military. The reason why I joined the military was because my friends were going off to school and being a kid that came from a, uh, a parent, a mother, and a grandmother that raised me. I didn't have the funds to go to college. So I enrolled and went uh, to uh, the Air Force. Uh, I spent three, three months 
in uh, Lackland for training, for, for military training, basic training. And from there I went to <clears throat> Amarillo, Texas for nine months of training for my field. My field was called Administrative and Human Resources. Uh, finished there, and then it, I was assigned to go to Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, and I spent two years there. And at that time, the Vietnam issue came up, and I was deployed to uh, Tan Sha Nu in Vietnam. And from there, I went to Cameron Bay. And from there, I went back to Tan Sha Nu, and my left assignment was West, was Westover. And then assigned to Westover, I was deployed to go with what they're trying to call TDY, temporary duty, to, to uh, Guam Air Force Base, and then to Hawaii. I spent the time there, and I came back to Westover, and I got out of the service in 1967, and I've been a member uh, here in Holyoke since that time. Good afternoon. My name is John, John L. Kennedy. I was born in America, Georgia. I graduated from high school in that town. Then I came to Massachusetts in 1954. And in, in, uh, a friend of mine, he wanted to go in the military, so in January of 55, we decided to go in the military. So I joined the Army. I took my basic training in Fort Riley, Kansas. We stayed all night in, 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 in the visit training in Fort Riley. Then we in a gyro to Germany in September of that year. And during the time I was in the military, I showed you pictures. I was in artillery. I showed you pictures here. <laughs> Let you know what artillery means. <laughs> With the big guns. Okay, you pass it out. And if you can find that picture, I'll hear you. <laughs> and after I spent 27 months in Germany, and, and I really love Germany. During the time I've been in Germany, I visited Amsterdam, Holland, which was a nice town, and people were very friendly. Then I, all together, I spent 27 months in Germany. Then I came back home. Then I was, had a break in service, and I was at my brother's house, and so a recruiter came around, and 1978, I decided to join the, uh, the Army Reserve. So I joined the Army Reserve, and I'd like to see what the other, get the units out in. I bring everything where you can see. In <laughs> <laughs> uh, Army Reserve, I stayed in Army Reserve until I retired in 1996, May 1996, 27 years in the military. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, the first thing I would like to uh, let you uh, be aware of, we will, due to some issues that individuals have, we will not be talking about combat situations today. Uh, I'm sure that everybody is aware of that many people suffer from PTSD as a result of combat experience. But you may also not be aware that many people suffer from PTSD from experiences that they had in the military, around the military, that had nothing at all to do with combat. In doing my research for this, I spoke to a number of people who, uh, regarding their service, um, who I would have loved to have come and talk with you, but unfortunately, they felt that they would be very uncomfortable doing so due to their experience. Uh, one was a uh, retired officer, uh, another was a, as we would say, a grunt, an infantryman. Um, and I also spoke to a young lady uh, regarding her experiences in the military. And uh, I have to say, in, in all honesty, it was a uh, very uh, disturbing conversation in many ways. Um, and after my discussion with her, I totally understood why she had, would have a hard time. Not necessarily because of the events that happened to her, but of the events that happened to people that she knew and that she was aware of and that could have happened to her. Uh, so the purpose of this discussion today uh, is to 
give you an insight of what it, it is going, what it was like being a person of color in the military. And these, this doesn't necessarily mean that everything was bad. It doesn't necessarily mean everything was good. But it's just an interpretation of what it felt like. Uh, we will be open to uh, questions. To the, to the, we'll be open to you afterwards. And please do not hesitate to ask some questions of all of us. Uh, the first question that I would like to ask the panel up here, uh, yeah, great, is, is there any, excuse me, I'm sorry, but I gotta take these off. Is there anything that you were um, aware of that specifically applied to you as a black veteran? Was there any difficulty that was maybe? I'll tell you, when I was in Germany, when I first hit Germany, there was a little segregation there a while, for a while. And uh, Fred and I, we went to uh, a couple of places and it seemed like when we get there, they want to fight. So during the time, when they see it coming in, the MPs there right quick, so they stop everything. But it never had any other problem at all. Because the military had thought changing it. And they had eliminated all that segregation in the military during that time. So I never had any other problem. In the reserve program, I never had that problem, period, in the reserve program. How about anybody else on the panel? I have to agree with what Brother Kennedy said there. Of course, when I went into the military, it was in the 80s, and I didn't feel any of those issues were concerned through my active duty experiences. And of course, when I went to the reserves, this area is home, so I didn't really have any issues at all. I was very fortunate, very blessed, and I met some great people during my career, whether it was active duty or in the reserves, so I didn't feel there were any obstacles. Now, Lenore, you would be uh, involved with housing and, and uh, not necessarily the military, uh, the, the uh, every day, but you would also, but you would be involved with uh, things such as housing and opportunities that you as a military spouse would have. Did you run into any issues that you would, that you were aware? Not only, not yet as an issue, but when I was pregnant with my oldest son, one of my neighbors wanted to give me a shower. I didn't know that it was all over. Because of my color and other people didn't want to be involved with a baby shower for a black woman. So she did it on her own. She gave me things for her own. She was a she was a white lady, and she was a friend of mine. And afterwards, she told me as far as she couldn't give it to me. Other than that, I had no problems. You know, I didn't do a lot of visiting too, and I didn't have a cup of coffee with other uh, neighbors. So usually, as a whole, I didn't have much trouble. Thank God I did. Now, open to, this is open to everyone. How about? Uh, when it came to such things as military housing or, uh, as you say, off-duty hours, uh, were there any, did you run into any problems as to where you were allowed to associate and who you were allowed to associate with? For me, uh, military housing was fine. We always lived on military housing. We had no problems getting a house for a Sherman. He was uh, always blessed to get a house. Because of his rank, he was able to get a house. Maybe I should say that. Sooner. So it wasn't a problem. Anyone else? <clears throat> the only thing that I can say is I had two incidents when I was in the military facility. And the very first one was the, uh, the training, the three months training. And uh, I had a problem because me being from Alabama, a lot of other guys that was there, white guys that was there, they were from up and off here, and we had a problem with that. So the instructor, first thing he said to us that if you're going into service, you got to know each, everybody, you got to work together to, to support each other. Because if you go into war or something, you need some support. And then we, we got around that and became friends. Uh, <clears throat> in 62, when I was in Florida, of an incident happened, we went downtown to eat, Mil a military, just a regular, a regular clothes, we went down to eat. And we got there, we got seated, 
and they would wait on the other three white guys, but they would not wait on me. So the other three guys said, we're not going to eat here, so we left, we left together. We waited two months, we went back in our military uniform, and they served everybody. So uh, that was, you know, kind of eye-opening to me, because uh, other than that, I didn't have any problems, because I was always one that stuck by myself all the time. And always, I think, the part that helped me through was I became a part of, of the chapel service on, on base, on every base. Mm -hmm. And I worked in, in the chapel service there, so I got to know a lot of people there, you know, ministers and priests and all who all worked together. But other than that, I had no problem. Other than two incidents when I was in service. Anyone else? I can relate to uh, what you're saying as far as uh, <coughs> restaurants, etc. Uh, when I was in basic training, uh, we had an incident uh, about maybe four weeks into basic training. Uh, we used to go down to the PX, and uh, a group of um, southern young men used to be there ahead of us most of the time. And of course, we had a lot of uh, country western music on the jukebox. And one particular afternoon, uh, apparently we got there before they did, and uh, we started playing some Motown. And um, a short while later, they started to show up, and uh, we wound up with a major confrontation. And when I say major, they wound up having to call EMPs. Uh, there was some discussion as to whether or not uh, certain individuals were going to wind up in the stockade. Um, and uh, we lost our PX privileges for about two weeks as a result of it. And, um, but it was uh, surprising because, and it caught a lot of us by surprise, because we had gone, like most people that go into the military and, uh, and other organizations, is that once you go in and you're wearing the same uniform, you're all together but we still ran into that same problem. Uh, another issue that I ran into um, was when I was down in Texas doing my advanced individual training, I was fortunate to uh, be sent to what they call a leadership training school, which was, uh, they made me a squad leader for the, for the group I was in. And there was a number of individuals who were from southern states and they made it known quite loudly that they did not want to take any orders from me. Uh, one gentleman um, made it a point, not necessarily to my face, but to a lot of other individuals that if I continued to give him orders, that he was going to take it out on me. And um, I tried to do it as diplomatically as I could, uh, but what it wound up happening was I, I had one of my roommates who happened to be a distant cousin of Elvis Presley. Uh, <laughs> I said to him one day, I said, look, I need you to do me a favor. I said, I need you to go out and start talking to the guys. But partway through your conversation, I need you to tell them that you forgot something in the room and ask this gentleman to come and pick it up for you. And he did so. And when the young man came into our room, I was standing behind the door and I closed the door on him. And I basically said to him that I understand you and I have a problem with me giving you orders and you don't want to take them from me or anybody that looks like me. And I said, here's the thing. Number one, before you leave this room, we are going to have this ironed out. And I said, I don't think that you can go through me to get out the door. <laughs> so we need to make sure we get this done. Well, needless to say, we got it taken care of and I didn't have a problem with him for the next two weeks. Nor did I have a problem with any of his friends. Uh, but this was, even though this was 1964, and I think one thing that had a lot to do with it, while yes, I was in the military in 1964, uh, there were a lot of things that were happening on the outside. And that carried over in a lot of ways to the, mili to the military. Because there were a number of people who felt that we were getting, as they, as they would say, too uppity 
and therefore they felt that they needed to put us in our place. Now, did you find um, that your NCOs, et cetera, in dealing with you on your jobs, did they give you, did they treat you as far as your accomplishments the same way as they treated your non, uh, uh, NCO, not NCOs necessarily, but your, your, uh, your white counterparts? Or did they feel that, you know, we need to give you extra push because you just weren't capable or didn't have the skills to do it? Well, I had an incident to have to meet with my uh, NCO. Uh, but I mean, working in, you know, specialist, administrator in, 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 in uh, human resources, I had a problem because uh, he couldn't understand why I had so much knowledge of what to do and how to do it. So I explained to him why. He said, you can't have that kind of knowledge. I said, why not? He said, you don't have that kind of knowledge. So I had to do like you. Okay. Can I sit you on the outside? So we went outside and we had a nice talk. And between the talk and fighting, <laughs> we came back in. Now I realized this guy was younger than I were. Okay, but he was my supervisor. Okay. So uh, after that, we became close friends. Uh, and a lot of things that the people could understand, human resource and, and finance side, is that I understood it. And uh, I was getting promotion like crazy, and they couldn't understand why. Uh, it was because of the knowledge, the knowledge that I had. And I, I thank the military for that because when I got out of service, came to West, came to West over, and then I got out of service. I went to work for uh, Spalding in Chicopee. I was working there, <coughs> and the, uh, the bank at the time was uh, Oh, I forgot the name of it. <laughs> but, but the current name now was, was uh, Community Savings Bank. And I worked there. In fact, I did not start working there. Reverend Hall from, from Bethlehem right. noticed that I had, he said, I want you to go down and apply for a job at the bank. I said, but I can, you, you, you can do it. So I went down and applied for the, for, 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 for the job. And the lady in Henry said, so why, how can you understand all this information? I said, well, I got both of them from, from, from the military. And she said, well, you have more knowledge than I do. Okay. So I began to work in the bank, and I went through the bank, the position in the bank, and ended up being one of the branch managers. And I thank the military for giving me that service to go through that the experience that I had in, in that part. And, but it helped me out a lot in my life. Does anybody up there? Okay, not problem. I, I didn't. Didn't have much problem in this service because I have I brought pictures of what you see that, <laughs> that uh, my friends and I we all got along together. We all did the same section and we all got along together. No problem at all when I was in Germany. Okay, thank you. Yeah, see it. Uh, well, Nora, of course. One of the pictures there with my best friend there, he was he was from Mexico from uh, from New Mexico. Me and him were just like that. Very close to us. He passed away with leukemia. Lenore, the question I would have for you: uh, You served, a, you were a peer for a long time. Did you have any problems? Uh, I know we often think of problems with housing and things like that as being something that happens in other areas of this country. Uh, but did you have any problems, let's say, uh, in, in the Northeast and? In, in, uh, some of the other bases, like in the Midwest, as far as housing was concerned? He never had any problems. Never had any problems? Usually he knew when he was going before we arrived, he put his name on the list. He used when we got there, we had a house. Sometimes we're going to bases and we got a new house. For Raleigh, Kansas, we were able to get a, a house that never lived in. They just built those houses. So we, even when we came here, we had trouble getting these houses. Always aim to get things out. Now, did you have any problems, like say, for example, at Westover? I know at one point in time there was some issues uh, with housing in Westover. No, we didn't have any. Uh, I, I, we didn't have any, any problems. Sherman spoke. 
he spoke. And if he saw a problem, he took care of it. Okay. He, everybody knows he's always, he didn't do a lot of talking. Everybody in this area knows him, he didn't do a lot of talking. When he needed to talk, he talked. So when we got the base housing, he got base housing. No problem. Okay. Now, if for, for those of you who don't know what I'm speaking about, uh, there was a point in time uh, at Westover that there was not a lot of housing for uh, black veterans. And it reached a point where it was so bad that the commandant at uh, Westover threatened the city of Chicopee uh, to close the base. Uh, now, not a lot of people are aware of that fact, but it did happen. Uh, we, we often think of incidents like this as being only things that happen you know, in the southern states or the, the western states, but it does happen in this area also. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I think one of the other questions that I would ask is, um, what would be, if you were in a situation where you could make some changes in how black veterans were treated in the military, what would be some of the suggestions that you would make? I would say based on the situation, but it should apply to all situations, basically treat everybody as an equal. I mean, because we know, of course, all the obstacles that have taken place in the past, if there's a way to fix them, fix them. What I'd say is uh, people don't realize we have one life to live, so we should all try to enjoy ourselves with peace. And peace should go all around the world. We should all learn that. I'm not a veteran, but my statement. You're a veteran. <laughs> uh, my statement is, if you're treated one way in the military, why can't you be treated the same way you got out of the military or retired from the military? You're the same person. Why can't you be treated the same way? A lot of a, a lot of military men have worked so hard in the military, they come up and they can't get a job. That's the point I'm trying to make. All right. Yeah, if I could do it in the military, why can't I do it outside the military? If I'm good enough to do it in there, why can't I do it on the outside? Why take you over me when I have the experience and you don't? Okay. okay. Now, from listening to the uh, statements from, from John and, and James, um, was your thought that by going into the military, uh, you would be able to improve your, your capabilities, uh, your opportunities at that time? Well, my main thing when I went into service was to support my mother. I had, had uh, it was my mother and grandmother, and I had, I had uh, three sisters, and I was the oldest. I went into service with understanding to get into service and maybe send some money back to support the family. That was my main concern. But once I got in there, I realized that it could be an opportunity for me also. Then I started taking courses, and you know, um, I went to Florida to do to, you know, college courses. My main concern I first went in was for finance to support my mother and my, and my three sisters. Mm -hmm. Well, my, I wasn't getting ready to go into the military. The reason I went in is because a friend of mine, we were hanging around together, and he wanted to go in. So he told me, he said, come on, John. I said, well, okay, I'll go with you to go in. Well, I wasn't planning on signing up. And so when I got there, he said, well, you might want to sign up also. I said, oh, okay, so I signed up for it. And then the time we couldn't, I signed up, I passed the exam, everything, and, and, and they called him to, uh, they wanted to talk to him about something. And next time I see him, I'd be sworn in. <laughs> he said, I'm going back home because he had some medical. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> and I didn't see him no more to another year or two. So I went in. 
<laughs> now, how about you, Marvin? Because you, you are one of the longer serving individuals, both active duty and, re and reserve duty, and even re active reserve duty. Um, what's your, your, your philosophy on that? I went in because at the point I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't play enough football where I was getting looks from schools. I think I had looked for only one school. So I pretty much decided, you know what, let me just go in the military. And I initially I was just thinking about just going in for four years, then go to school. And actually my uncle Wayman, after I got out of active duty, he's like, you know what, you should go make some more money. You know, that's, you know, so you know my uncle, that's his way. Yes. And yes. so I did it and I then all together put in 30 years, so it was it was basically I thought it was a good opportunity at the time. Because I kind of procrastinated when it came to the sports, like well just deciding on whether I wanted to go to college or not. So I thought it was the right decision at the right time. And I'm th thankful that I did that. I'm thankful that God blessed me throughout those 30 years from 1983 to 2013 for my military career. And, and then even to this day, he's still blessing me. And I'm thankful for that. Right. Okay. I guess the key question that I would ask all of you, that if you had the knowing what you know now and your experience, would you do it all over again? I would. Thank you. I would. I would. I would. Okay. Well, I, I thank you and, uh, for your observations. Uh, I would now like to open it up to the floor for any questions that anybody would have from the floor. Uh, feel free to ask. As I said, the only thing that I would ask of you is that you refrain from any questions regarding combat situations.
the discrimination. All right. All right. If, if I might add something to uh, what she just said, if you uh, were to go, and I have done it, if you were to go into Holyoke's records, you will not find a record of Liberty Park. Because I have looked on several occasions to try to find some historic background on Liberty Park, and there is no record. And that was a very important part of Holyoke at one time, as far as the black community is concerned. Uh, any more questions, please? If you wouldn't mind just standing, because my eyesight is not very good. So if you raise your hand, I probably would not have You want me to stand there? Yes, please. Just so that tomorrow you can speak. I'm from Springfield, Massachusetts. I was born and raised in Springfield, educated in Springfield. Went in the Marine Corps from Springfield and never knew what it was to be black until I went into the Marine Corps. Because the Marine Corps, they got their own definition of what it means to be black. And they don't use the letter B, they use the letter N. And as quiet as it's kept, during the Vietnam War, they ran out of cannon fodder. They ran out of bodies to put in the military as a draft. So Secretary of Defense McNamara came out with a program called Project 100,000. And what he did, back then if you were a 4F, that meant you were ineligible to go in the military because you had a physical disability or you were mentally competent to go. But when they couldn't find any more people to go, what did they do? They went back and recycled all those four Fs. And back in those days, predominantly, the ones that were four Fs were the poorly educated blacks, the ones that had physical problems, and McNamara said it was providing those folks that went in with a vocational occupation opportunity. But of the project 100,000, 85% of the ones that they got were sent to frontline combat units and the casualty rate in those units was really high. But I wish that the historical perspective of what the military is and isn't needs to be touched on because there was a time when they didn't want blacks in the military. Matter of fact, there was a commandant his quote was, I'd much rather have 5,000 white troops than 350,000 blacks. Now, that's saying something. But I got a witness here with me because I don't like to talk out of turn. This gentleman here, he and I have been bunkies ever since we couldn't even walk. But in the Marine Corps, they have something called drown proofing, water survival. Because back in those days, you didn't fly, you were on a ship. So if you went down in the ocean, you had to know how to survive in the water. Because you sure couldn't swim to shore. <laughs> so in boot camp, this is how I saw my drill instructors. They took all the blacks and held them to the end. And this pool was about 12 feet deep. 
And then they threw all the blacks in the water. And me and my buddy here, we grew up in the south end of Springfield. And we went swimming every day. So when we hit the water, it wasn't a devastating experience. But there were some southern blacks that may have been swimming in a pond or a lake, but when they hit that 12 feet of water, they looked like Johnny Wisemiller fighting the alligators, splashing and going. And the drill instructors thought it was funny. They sat there and laughed. And they had these big, long bamboo poles. And they take the bamboo pole and put it out there, and they tell you, just hold on to it and pull you to the shore. But some of those brothers that were in the water that was drowning, they walked right up that pole. And the drill instructor would let the pole go. And they really tried to kill black veterans who wanted to become Marines. Because they just didn't want us in there. And like in Vietnam, we only constituted 11% of the population, but we were 35% of the frontline combat troops. And the other disparities that we saw were we were not awarded the same medals and decorations as our white counterparts. And this is not me just voicing my opinion. Anybody who wants to go look up Project 100,000, you can see that. And you can also see where there has been a disproportionate amount of bad paperwork given to black veterans. And that's why you have a lot of black veterans that are homeless, because Getting bad paperwork is like the kiss of death. I'm going to sit down and be still. But I, I, I got to say one last thing. When I went in the military, there were three of us who were supposed to go. We were going in on the buddy plan. So we went down and took the test. And I scored well enough that I could get aviation guarantee. So that aided that I wasn't going to be no gravel cruncher. I was going to be working on airplanes. My other two friends they didn't pass the test for the Marine Corps, so they got drafted into the Army. Now, the Marine Corps, you had to do four years. But when you got drafted, you only got two. But I didn't know that until the day we all got sworn in. <laughs> and I told my buddy, I said, I was all teared up. I said, man, I'm going to see you in four years. We'll get together in two years. He said, Tom, I only signed for two. <laughs> but I went to an aviation school in Memphis, Tennessee. In 1966, I stayed at the Lorraine Hotel where Martin Luther King was killed at. I was down there when they had the sanitation strike. And believe you me, being in Memphis, and the Marine Corps, you really get a definition of who you are being black. Now sometimes, being up north, we get lulled into the fact that it's all good. When I was in Memphis, they let me know it ain't all good. And we don't care if you're wearing a uniform or not, you're still a nigger. You're just a military nigger but you're still a nigger. And they called me that so much, it's like it's imprinted inside my eardrums. But you said you didn't want to talk about combat. <laughs> so 
I won't address that, but I will say because of racism in the military, there were black veterans that got ganged up on, beat up, killed, just because they were black. Yeah, and you can all say, oh, we're all supposed to be on the same team. Yeah, but there's one man out if you're black. Army 23 years. I just want to speak on one little issue. Attesting to what this gentleman just said, uh, all due respect to those who had no problems in the Army when you were there, but I wasn't in that Army. I was never in that Army. I was, I seen the military as it was as a black man. And it was obvious there were two militaries there. It was never one military. Okay? A good example is I went to Fort Rolla, Missouri. Not Fort Rolla, but the town I was in, Leonardwood, Missouri. I traveled outside of town to a little town called Fort, uh, Rollo, where a Spanish guy and a white guy who lived in Rollo. All right, no, it was an Indian gentleman. But when I got to his house, I realized that I wasn't welcome there, and his mom came out and asked me to leave. Where am I going to go? I'm a young 16 year old soldier. 16 years old because you could get in the military six months prior to your 17th birthday. First time I had a suit and mine happened to be green at that time. Went out to visit this young man. They asked me to leave. I said, well, where are you guys going? He said, we're going to the bowling alley. I said, I'll go to the bowling alley. He said, well, you can't bowl in our bowling alley. Okay, well, I'll just sit there and wait till you're done. No, you can't even come inside. Besides, all niggers got to be off the street at 7 o'clock. Wow. Here it was, almost sundown. I left the town and started walking. I walked until I finally came to the only bus station which had one gas pump on a dirt road in this sorry town of Warrago where I went in to buy a ticket and they would not sell me one. I'm in uniform, my only green suit. They wouldn't sell me one. When I told him, I said, I see the tickets right there. He said, boy, I told you, we don't have any tickets. So what did I do, 16 years old? I never read a newspaper. I wasn't educated. I joined the military because I was hungry and wanted an education and wanted some type of organization in my life. And this is what I got. So what did I do? They had one phone booth sitting there at the end of the gas station. It was about 50 feet from the gas station. I walked up the road. I called my aunt in Pittsburgh. I'm crying on the phone because it was a carload of white guys, and they were drinking, and they just decided to take this nigger out. So what did I do? My aunt said, well, start walking. I hung up the phone. I started walking up the highway. I can hear them in their cars, they're throwing bottles and chains at me. So I start walking, finally jumped in the car, it's getting dust, they followed me up there. I started running, when they got close, I went over the hill, down into the cornfield, and I stayed in the cornfield. I stayed in that cornfield and I watched those idiots throwing stuff down at me, talking about soldier boy. Well finally it got dark enough and I stayed in that cornfield. When it finally got light enough to get out of the cornfield, I stood up, I walked and looked both ways. There were no cars coming at all. This was rural, all right? So finally, as I started walking, I see one car coming. Here it comes, I'm thinking, here it comes. I run back into the cornfield, car pulls up, a white lady pulls up in the car, winds down the window and says, I know you're out there. I'm sorry for what they did. First thing I'm thinking, I'm going to be fixed. You know, if I go up here, they're, they're going to get me. They're hiding somewhere. So I'm thinking, well, I really don't care, but I'll choke the living hell out of this lady here and take her car and leave. So I go up, I jump in the car, I close the door. I didn't even speak to her. I wanted to see what was going to happen next. She drove me all the way to Fort, Lewis, Fort Leonard Wood. When I was about 10 feet from the gate, I didn't wait for her to stop. I opened the door, jumped out, and ran 
into the post. And that wasn't the only incident I had with the Army. I think if you were high ranking or something like that, you were affiliated, and I learned later when I went into headquarters Stark that there was definitely not only two armies, there were three armies. There was another army for those, the echelon that had everything. And then there were the spec fours and the privates and the buck sergeants, and we got nothing as a black soldier. We were always second hand. And I learned to deal with it. Just like this gentleman, you learn to deal with it. And that's what I did when I was there. I didn't have a good time all the time. There were some good times. The best time I got out of the military is the retirement and the disability I'm living on now. Thank you. We have any more questions? If not, I would please go see the exhibit. Uh, do you have a question? I have a question. question. No question. I would like to just uh, commemorate the death of uh, uh, David Owens uh, from Holyoke. He was killed in Vietnam, 1967. They lived right around the corner here on Moon Street. I was with him in high school with uh, his brother Lou, Louis. Red Top was a fighter, and uh, <coughs> police here, I still call him police. That's okay. <laughs> is is uh, his niece, mm -hmm. but she never met him. So if we could have a moment of commemoration for, for him. Well, thank you. I do have one question. I know, you were clapping, you clapped for both, so I don't know. it's okay if I don't. So thank you, too, for doing that. And I do want to thank all of you who have served Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. I mean, I, and I have my newly uh, indoctrinated uh, U.S. Army soldier here, too, so I'm proud to say um, she joined in 2018. But, and and it's, it's funny, because we can say a she now, I know that they're now offering this opportunity for women, not too many women. The one question that I did want to ask, and we spoke some of it, is I think about even today where things have changed somewhat, but there are still areas that we need growth in when we talk about growing, development, when we all get our credentials. I just wanted to ask for anybody on the panel or anybody in the room, what was that like when you were in the military and when you did grow in rank or were there opportunities for you to grow in rank and still be accepted by your peers? I know you spoke um, somewhat to that, uh, Mr. Griffin, about your experience, but did anybody grow to, you know, I don't know what the highest officer is there is in the military, but did you have that same experience as your counterparts and you have a good experience with that? Tell you when I was in the uh, reserve, I was afforded equal opportunity NCO and sexual harassment NCO also. And I was in the reserve. When I was in the Air Force, uh, served for four years, and the highest rank you could make uh, at that time was uh, Air First Class. When I left the service in '67, I was a tech sergeant, two steps above that. So, I think if you do go to see the exhibit, and you see the exhibit that uh, Ms. Teagle has for her husband, her husband uh, achieved one of the higher, the highest NCO ranks in the military, and he had to work for that, and he did work for that. Um, so there is, and there was for some individuals, a means of, I'm sure that he worked very hard for it, because uh, as my uncle used to tell me all the time, you might be good, but you've got to show everybody that you're better than the next person. Otherwise, you're not going to get the opportunity. And it's, I think that's an important asset. And I would say this much. 
that most individuals that I'm aware of and that I know and have come in contact with, um, their benefit from their military experiences has been what they were able to pass on to their children and their grandchildren on what to look for, how to achieve, uh, not be afraid to work hard, and above all, and I think probably the most important aspect of it is, nothing's given to you. If you want to achieve it, you got to go get it. And in our particular case, you got to work hard. You, excuse me. You have to work twice as hard as the next person because nobody's just going to hand it to you. And I think that's important. Uh, sure. Sorry, go ahead. It's very important. Like you said, my husband attained a high rank and the NCO could attain in a certain amount of years, and I'm not saying this, I have to pay it to prove it. He, he, he won a lot of medals. Anybody can look it up. He applied for a civilian job, he wasn't qualified. Mm -hmm. That's the part I'm thinking about. He, he attained the highest rank you can. He, when he was in school, he came with the highest military uh, sergeant. He was number two in his class, 192. These things are black and white, but he came to get a civilian job. He wasn't qualified. He had an education, he could associate degree, he wasn't qualified. That's the difference being in the military coming out into the civilian life looking for a job. Okay. It, somebody else have a question? Yeah. Uh, I, when I was in uh, in the Marines with uh, my partner here. Like I said, we grew up since we were about two years old and stuff. So we have a long story, a long history to tell, you know, but uh, one thing when I was in the, when I was in the Marines, they had a standard to let your hair grow three inches. But the black people, black guys, we couldn't grow our hair three inches. It's a double standard. You know, it's white guys, their hair grows three inches, they can lay it down. We had big froze, we weren't allowed to have that. So that was one of the things that ended there, you know, was a discrepancy in the Marine Corps. Another thing, uh, after uh, Martin Luther King got killed, they had a town out in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Blacks were not allowed to go across the tracks into the black neighborhoods. If we were caught across the track, they put us in the brig. They locked us up and stuff just for going into a black neighborhood. So we were not allowed to do that. So this was part of the you know, there was discrimination in the military. Um, there was one episode that I wanted to stay in. I did eight years in the, in the Marines. Um, they told me, they said, well, I wanted to do 20, but the Marine Corps told me, well, I, I was gonna get married. The Marine Corps said, well, if we wanted you to have a wife, what would the issue you want? You know, so, <laughs> and that way we should be trained the way we wanted to be trained. You know, so I almost, Cold cocked to the lieutenant, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, at that point in time, I was what they call a, a bounty hunter. I was going around the country picking up guys and bringing them back to prison. And, and, and you know, I felt good about, well, I don't know if I felt good or bad, but, you know, being on a plane with a, with a nine millimeter and got, at, at 20 years old. Yeah, I'm looking at the kids today at 20 years old. Well, they got them anyway, but it's, you know, but this was one of the things that I saw, you know, like I say, in the military, they give you jobs that you didn't know how to do, but they also give you jobs that you were trained to do. Now, I have a book here which will help solve a whole bunch of problems. I don't know, some of you may have read it. You want to know about discrimination? Anybody seen the book called Bloods? This book called Bloods was written by a friend of mine, Wallace Terry. He was in the foxholes in Vietnam, in the combat zone, and these guys telling you exactly what they felt about Vietnam, the racism and stuff like that. This was book, was, like I said, if you can find this book, I've been had this book since, uh, oh, I've been had this book since 1983. <laughs> okay, this book doesn't leave my house. Okay, but if you want to find out, and it's called Bloods. Now we had a thing in Vietnam, we don't care if it was Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and never. And they call it Bloods because when a brother walk up to each other, we give ourselves some dap, what they call dap. We give it like this, 
And if this was just strictly a black thing, okay, white guys didn't know nothing about this. They didn't know what, we, what it meant. You know, there was a saying that we did have, uh, um, there was a, we come up and we do like this. It, it says, we were on the bottom, this hand's on the bottom. Now we're on top. Now we fought side by side, and now we're together. That's what we did over, over and now. So anybody that came up, like I said, didn't make a difference whether you're in the Air Force, it was just a brother's thing over there in the military. So like I said, if you want to get very, anything about real words coming from veterans in the foxhole, uh, Wallace Terry wrote this book. He was actually in the foxhole with these guys while they were fighting at the end. So if you can, you can find this book called, called The Bloods. Thank you. Well, if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. I'd like to thank you for your participation. Above all, I'd like to thank Mysteria Hearst for their participation. Um, I would like to put in two plugs, if you don't mind. Uh, one, uh, if I know that Springfield has a very active black veterans organization. Uh, I'm sure that if you want to get some more information, beyond what we're doing today. Uh, if you contact these two gentlemen here, they may be able to turn you into uh, to who runs that operation. And the other thing is that right here in Holyoke, we have a very active veterans lunch. You don't have to be black to attend. You just have to be hungry. <laughs> uh, Gina is here today, and I'm very happy to have her here today. Uh, and again, thank you, Wisteria Hurst. Thank